December 26, 1944, in the Sarchio River Valley sector in the vicinity of Soma Colonia, Italy. It's 0800 hours when Lieutenant John Fox, member of Cannon Company 366 Infantry, acts as a forward observer while attached to the 598th Field Artillery Battalion. During Christmas night, there was a gradual influx of enemy soldiers, and by early morning, the town was mainly in enemy hands. There were reports that the Germans were heavily shelling the area. Although most of the U.S. infantry forces withdrew from the town, Lieutenant Fox and members of his observer party volunteered to remain behind in a sentry tower directing defensive fire. Lieutenant Fox reported Germans were in the streets and attacking in strength. It is at this time Lieutenant Fox gives the order for the next strike. The commander believes that the coordinates are wrong because he says, Fox, that's going to be right on top of you. However, Lieutenant Fox knows what he is asking. He also knows what he is about to sacrifice. We come from innovators, heroes, and royalty. We have always been our ancestors' greatest hope. We face many challenges, but we mold that adversity into our greatest strength. We are the glue that holds a nation together and allows it to flourish. Welcome to Black is America, the podcast where we highlight little-known African-American figures and stories that makes our history come to life. I'm your host, Dominic Lawson. Episode 1, Lieutenant John Fox, an All-American Hero. The first time I heard of Lieutenant John Fox was honestly one day with me scrolling on social media and coming across a friend's post that he shared. As I'm sitting here reading the article, my first thought as a fellow Army vet myself was, I'm not even worthy to lace this man's boots. I mean, in the heat of battle, to be able to call an artillery strike on himself in order to achieve the mission. I mean, honestly... I wouldn't even have the nerve to call a water balloon strike on myself, let alone artillery fire. Such bravery and resolve to make a call like that. I had to know more. My next thought was wondering how come I never heard of Lieutenant John Fox? I mean, I had heard of many other African-American war heroes like Benjamin O. Davis, the first African-American general on active duty. And then there's the late general and former secretary of state, Colin Powell. Then there is, um, oh, cut the music for a sec. Now that I think about it, there are only those two that we mostly hear about, I guess. Huh. Well, on this show, we're going to change that a bit. So like I was saying, that was the first time I heard of Lieutenant John Fox, and I was intrigued. But for a good friend of mine, she first heard about Lieutenant Fox in a different way. I certainly got involved slowly and <laughs> and in many ways unexpectedly. This is Solis Wells, educator, researcher, and author of Braided in Fire, Black G.I.s and the Tuscan Villagers on the Gothic Line. And in some time in 1980, she bought a house in a small Italian village of Soma Colonia. I was writing these very reflective sort of journal pieces even after we uh, bought this ruin of a house in this uh, medieval village right. Soma Colonia and uh, right under my feet of course was this extraordinarily <laughs> dramatic story it took a while uh, I would hear from my neighbors you know these amazing experiences they had during World War II and I was I was right away fascinated but the minute they stopped talking, it would disappear because here we were in this very bucolic, isolated little stone village with, you know, still practicing the old ways at the time we moved there. So it was a, it was a real Codadino village, which meant that word means peasant in, in English. But it has a, a richer connotation in Italian because it, 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 it they were poor, but they own their own land, albeit rocky and, you know, poor soil and difficult to cultivate. But they had a 
a social kind of traditions that were very rich. And so, you know, I, I, I simply couldn't envision machine guns and, and, and mortars and in, in the midst of these beautiful gardens vegetable gardens and, and prize-winning geraniums. You know, it didn't compute for a long time. So after understanding a bit of the history, she sought out to preserve it. So finally, though, uh, you know, watching some of the old elder villagers die, I realized somebody's got to capture this story. And then I knew nothing about John Fox until I saw the, the marker in this little village uh, memorial, um, the Martiri de la Resistenza, which is a little memorial at the top of the village to seven partisan fighters who had died in the um, Soma Colonia battle. And uh, then I noticed this marker for John Fox. It said, is there Chito USA? And I'm going, whoa, why? what's this doing in an Italian monument, you know? And I, and I asked around and nobody in the village knew anything about him. It was a very long time before. Before, I mean, I started the investigation about what happened during World War II way before I found out what in the world John Fox did or who he was, you know, because it, he wasn't famous. It looks like Solis had the same questions I had as well. As a military veteran, I am very familiar with terms and phrases such as honor, bravery, duty, and love of country. And given this country's history of racism and Jim Crow, all that goes to another level with the African-American soldier. But even with all that, John Fox was still of a different breed. So I wanted to know more about his upbringing, his family, and where he grew up. He was the oldest of three kids. We do know that he was born on May 18, 1915 in Cincinnati, Ohio. However, he grew up on the outskirts of Cincinnati. So I was curious about the neighborhood he grew up in. Maybe it would shed some light on who he was. I grew up on Lincoln Heights, 12 miles from downtown Cincinnati, north on uh, off of I-75. And I-75 connects um, Cincinnati with Canada. This is Carl Westmoreland, senior historian at the National Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati and native to the area where Lieutenant John Fox grew up. My connection to Mr. Westmoreland was not the best, but if there's anything that is unclear, Be sure to go to blackisamericapodcast.com for the full transcript. Here again is Mr. Westmoreland. The community in which I lived was called Wyoming. Um, The white people who lived there, um, for the most part, were upper class. You could probably count upper class blacks who lived there a dozen um, and two dozen at the most. And while they were a small community, they were definitely a proud and hard working one. While some were of the tradition of the man went to work and the woman stayed home, many of the married couples had three jobs between the two of them. Here's Mr. Westmoreland again. So consequently, my dad worked three jobs, but he wasn't going to have my mother uh, go to Wilberforce and then come home and do domestic work. Wilberforce was also the school Lieutenant John Fox attended, but I'll get to that in a second. Now, around this time, many African-American families around the country worked blue-collar jobs that required some type of uniform or clothes that let you know that they worked really hard, like heavy cotton coveralls, particularly if you were in construction or manufacturing. But on Sundays for church, they put on that Sunday finery, and it appears that in Wyoming, Ohio, they were not any different. My grandparents were uh, Baptists and... Uh, AME. And, you know, back then, you really didn't know what they did because on Sunday, everybody dressed up. Uh, everybody uh, had some role at church. Uh, they either sang a choir or they, they did something that, that, that just disguised, frankly, the fact that most of them had houses, but uh, they worked like hell to get them and keep them. So we knew a little bit more about where Lieutenant John Fox grew up. But being close to where he lives, I wanted to know if he possibly knew him. Maybe his family knew him. Maybe he even met him. Here's Mr. Westmoreland again. He was, he was uh, three years younger than my mother and six years younger than my father. My two aunts, Eva and Margaret, were talking about what happened 
the the report they got. Uh, and but as they talked about him, God, I thought the man was about twelve foot tall. But I'd never seen him. Or if I had seen him, I didn't know him uh, because I really didn't have any reason to, except my parents knowing. He uh, was in ROTC. He went to Wilberforce. Okay. This brings me to the school that was mentioned earlier, Wilberforce, the HBCU about 60 miles north of Cincinnati in the city of the same name. Now, Lieutenant John Fox wanted to be an officer in the Army, so he knew the best way to do that was to go to university and enroll in the ROTC program. So he initially attended Ohio State, but there was an issue. Here is Solis again, this time reading an excerpt from her book. He first attended Ohio State University, but transferred to Wilberforce because at the time, it was one of only three universities in the entire country that allowed black Americans into their ROTC programs. And he wanted that training. And there it is. Good old classic seasoned real nice racism. Hold up, stop the music again. Um, Really quick, I'm just going to let you know right now that here on the Black is America podcast, that's going to be a common theme on this show. I mean, you probably already knew that based on the title, but I just wanted to make it plain. Okay, let's get back to it. Here is Solis again. That although he had given up a lot of credits in transferring, it was worth it. And boy, was it worth it. Because John Fox was about to get quite the mentor at Wilberforce. Let's go back to Mr. Westmoreland for a second, because around the same time he learned about John Fox in a conversation with his aunt's, he also learned about someone else. And then in the process, well, he's not the only one. You know so-and-so. And then they talked about um, the head of the uh, ROTC program at Wilberforce, who... Um, this is Aaron Fisher, correct? Yes. Captain Aaron Fisher, head of the ROTC department at Wilberforce and a highly decorated Army veteran. Captain Fisher, or Cap as he was called by many of his students, was no stranger to going beyond the call of duty when the situation was dire. You know what? Let me back up a bit so you can know exactly the kind of badassery Captain Aaron Fisher was on. It's September 3rd, 1918 in La Sous, France, where at the time, Lieutenant Fisher and his men are manning a trench when it was invaded by Germans. Lieutenant Fisher and his men are greatly outnumbered. However, Lieutenant Fisher commands his men to stand their ground and maintain control of the trench. He refused to abandon his position and in the process was severely wounded. However, he was able to hold his position until reinforcements arrived to finish off the last of the German soldiers. And on his return home, he received the Distinguished Service Cross for his bravery in addition to the Purple Heart for being wounded. The French government even awarded him the Croix de Guerre with a gold star for his courage and fortitude. So for Lieutenant Fox, he was not only going to learn from an American hero, but an American hero that looked like him. And even though he would have to give up some of his college credits to transfer, he was determined to be an officer in the United States military. Makes sense when you talk about a person who wanted to dedicate his life to public service. The next thing I wanted to know was, what was he like? Was he the hard-nosed military person? Was he a soft-spoken leader of men? Well, for the answer, Solis introduces us to a new character in this story. Caroline told me right uh, that she knew right away that her husband was going to make the Army his life. Solis is referring to Arlene Fox, John's wife, who she interviewed for the book. At this time, John has graduated from Wilberforce and is stationed at Fort Devens in the Boston area near Brockton, Massachusetts, where Arlene lived with her family. Here is Solis again, reading an excerpt from her book, Braided in Fire. She described a delightful courtship. They met at Franklin Park Riding Stable in the Boston neighborhood of Dorchester in August 1941, while Fox was stationed at Fort Devens. It's easy to understand how Arlene Morrow became a good rider, but less clear how John Fox, growing up in Woodlawn, a suburb of Cincinnati, also became an excellent equestrian. 
Evidently, he acquired his love of horses when, as a child, his family lived for a while in rural Lebanon, Ohio. However he managed to learn, he liked to ride and hunt. While a student at Wilberforce University, he earned money by training and exercising horses at a local stable. An equestrian, huh? That certainly is new information. Here is Solace again. Thinking back to the moment of their meeting, Arlene said, Oh dear, he was so friendly and sure of himself. He had such an easy smile and was handsome and tall and easy to talk to. Uh, on the tall part, I think he was um, 5'10", but Arlene was was quite petite, so that was really tall to her. Right. We had a grand old time, she laughed, remembering the delight of the start of to their romance. We went several times after that, riding out, you know. And then we had a lot of fun times together. We walked in the park, we rode, we went to the movies. We really got to know each other. I finally took him home, and oh my goodness, my family was crazy about him. He could ingratiate himself anywhere. He was just honest and outgoing, friendly. Once John and Arlene decided to marry, they planned a big wedding the following spring in Brockton to coincide with Arlene's father's birthday. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, they moved up their wedding date because they could not be certain when John might be shipped out. John was determined that they marry before this happened. December 7th, 1941 changed a lot of things for a lot of people that day. 2,335 souls were lost due to an attack by the Japanese a little before 8 a.m. that day. During that attack, an African-American Navy cook would take heroic action that would immortalize him in American history. But that's another story for another day. While they intended to have a small ceremony, Lieutenant Fox being quite the people person, those plans were altered a bit. Quote, we just decided to have a small January wedding in the chapel at Fort Devens. We thought this is what was, was going to happen. But as it turned out, he was so popular, all his buddies got together with their wives and when we came out of the chapel, it was a real military wedding with an arch of swords and all. We were so surprised. Oh, it was such a beautiful thing. And just as we came out, a rainbow came over and everybody said, oh, you were blessed. You were blessed. We were blessed. All right, I guess. We were blessed because even though it was short, it was a happy time. It was wonderful. And in a few short months, Lieutenant Fox and Arlene were about to be blessed again. And then to cap it all off, about three months after we got married, I became pregnant. John and Arlene would go on to give birth to a beautiful baby girl, Sandra. But there's an interesting story Arlene shares with Solis about the morning Sandra was born. She went into labor in the middle of the night at a time when the streets of Eyre, Massachusetts, a bedroom community for Fort Devens, were knee high in snow. John left the house in the dark on foot. It felt like she was alone for a long time, but when he returned, he was accompanied by a very hard-to-find tractor with its soldier driver, to which they attached a snowplow. Then he drove with his wife in the car behind the snowplow all the way to the hospital. Once they reached the hospital, dawn was breaking, the sky cleared, and Arlene said, to the dismay of the hospital attendants who, alerted by phone, had been expecting her, it's such a beautiful morning, and the streets near here are clear. Let's go for a little drive before I go in. While learning more about Lieutenant John Fox, that story stood out to me. But more about that later. Before Lieutenant Fox is deployed, he had a wonderful time with his family and his brand new baby girl. My Sandra was born in that December, and we had a year together as a family. In that year, we lived a lifetime of loving and caring. He was so proud of that child. We had some good times. Eventually, the time has come and Lieutenant Fox is shipped out. He makes a long voyage from the States to Europe. After a few stops around Europe, he finally makes it to the Italian theater, where he is attached to the 366th Infantry Regiment in the small village of Soma Colonia. This infantry regiment was all African-American, with notable veterans such as Edward Brooke, the first African-American after Reconstruction to be elected to the United States Senate. Also, Captain Aaron Fisher, who I mentioned earlier, the 366 was not only unique for being all African-American, but in fact, it was unique for another reason. It was a highly trained 
regiment, and all the uh, members of it were black, including the superior officers. The commanding officer, um, Donathan Queen, he was commanding colonel, was also black. And this, for the times, that this was highly unusual because although there were black soldiers, they had the, the higher ranking officers were all white. So this regiment was was special and 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 very well trained. Even though they were highly trained. They were still relegated to service detail when they got to Italy. Cooking, vehicle maintenance, logistics, you know, that sort of thing. Also, many of the high-ranking officers were stripped of their rank and were now to report to high-ranking white officers. Think about that for a second. These men were highly trained combat soldiers who wanted to prove to their country that they too can help win the war, all the while thinking that meritocracy would win out. And just for a little bit, you could escape that Jim Crow energy, at least for a little while, only to get to Italy, and it's like that digital underground song. All around the world, the same song. Well, anachronisms aside, word got back to the states that this was happening, which prompted pressure in numerous publications. And in November 1944, the soldiers of the 366 were moved to the front line. And when they got there, they were greeted by the new superior officer that gave them quite the welcome. And I don't mean that in a good way. General Edward Amon from Virginia, by all reports, an extremely prejudiced fellow. So what he did was uh, unspeakable, really. His wel- first of all, his welcome to these new troops that were just arriving under his command. Here was the, what, what, the way in which he welcomed them, the, these new troops, was, I did not send for you. This was his welcome speech. I did not send for you. Your Negro newspapers and Negro politicians and white friends have insisted that you see combat and I will see that you see combat and your share of the casualties. That was it. That was his welcome. Amidst all the reshuffling of the 366, Lieutenant Fox is attached to Cannon Company of the 598th Phil Artillery. He receives Phil Artillery training and he's pretty good at it due to him being great at math. That skill would prove vital very soon. Now, General Armand not only gave that very heartwarming welcome to the men of the 366, he also did something else that was even more despicable. Leading up to Christmas night, there were German forces otherwise known as the Wehrmacht building in the mountains near Soma Colonia, where Lieutenant John Fox and his fellow soldiers are at this time, and they are preparing for an attack. Lieutenant Fox had volunteered to be a forward observer in a sentry tower on Christmas Day. His job was to keep a lookout, but also direct artillery fire onto a target. The military command that was in charge of the 366, the All-Black Infantry Regiment, was fully aware of the buildup in forces, which makes this next part just downright inexcusable. Here is Solis again. But there was, in addition, an entire battalion of Americans who... And the, the, the commanding lieutenant colonel of that battalion got word that there was going to be an attack. And so what he did was to withdraw his troops. And um, and he had attached these 366 guys. Well, he just left them there knowing full well that there weren't enough of them to to withstand the kind of attack that was coming. He He simply withdrew. These 366 guys were just left in harm's way. Yeah. You heard that right. They simply just left the 366, including Lieutenant Fox, to essentially fend for themselves, knowing that an attack was imminent. Let me give you a brief tell of the tape here. In the village of Soma Colonia, there are about 75 soldiers from the 366 left there to defend it. Now, there are about 20 to 25 Italian partisans as well there to help fight for the cause. So this leaves about 100 soldiers to defend Soma Colonia. But there are about 300 Wehrmacht soldiers about to descend upon that village. So German soldiers will be facing a third of the size of their force in Soma Colonia. Hmm, that's interesting. Never mind, I'll explain later. Now, Wehrmacht soldiers were really tough. They were trained for dangerous missions, 
very often given very few resources to make them angrier, and they were young, which meant they were often more likely to take more risk. Lieutenant Fox would spend Christmas night on duty. He received a telegram and a cake from Arlene and his now two-year-old daughter, Sandra Fox. He shared his cake with some of his fellow soldiers. I have to imagine that for that brief moment, Lieutenant Fox and his fellow soldiers forgot the circumstances around them. But all of that changes a little before 5 a.m. the next morning. Lieutenant Fox and everyone left to defend Soma Colonia are alerted by German small arms and mortar fire. Lieutenant Fox doesn't hesitate. Even though this is his first action as a forward observer, he rises to the challenge, quickly calling artillery fire on the Germans, and it lands in its desired spot. After the threat is neutralized, there is silence. Then there is machine gun fire. Again, Lieutenant Fox calls in the proper coordinates for another strike. And again, he hits his mark. Now, the sentry tower that Lieutenant Fox is in is quite strategic. It's high enough to see the entire village and the surrounding parts. This means that Lieutenant Fox can see the Germans coming well in advance to call out artillery strikes. Around 9 a.m., the Germans tried to resupply troops with ammunition. And once again, Lieutenant Fox stymied those plans. Here is Solis. Getting close to nine in the morning when mm-hmm. he spotted a mule train because, you know, there was no road right. leading to this little village at that time. So they were supplied by mules and he spotted a, a mule train bringing ammunition to the Axis troops, to the to the Germans. And he had to coordinate, you know, their movement and everything. And But he got a real hit and, and his buddy said, you know, that was a good hit, John. We, you know, I could see the animals are down. And- At this point, the 366 and the Italian partisans are holding their own in battle. But things are about to take a turn. However, it seems that the Germans did not run out of ammunition, whereas the Americans were very low on ammunition. Also, it was expected that the Germans might invade from the north, but they also invaded from multiple sides. This would be difficult if the odds were even, but remember, the Germans outnumbered the defenders of Soma Colonia three to one. Remember what General Allman said. And I will see that you see combat and your share of the casualties. And unfortunately, he kept his word. Here again is Solis. There was no relief. They, they sent up a, a, a platoon but to, to help, but they were immediately overrun. And so that was another failure of Almonds. He didn't provide for replacements or troops that would be able to, to come in. It's now a little before 11 a.m. And Soma Colonia is completely overrun. Lieutenant Fox can hear the Germans and their small arms fire all below him. He reports the Germans were in the streets and attacking in strength. Some of the forces have started to retreat, but he decides, along with a few others, to stay behind, calling more artillery fire. By him staying behind, he allows more soldiers to retreat while slowing the advance of the German soldiers. Lieutenant Fox calls in another strike, but this one is dangerously close to his position. It's a hit. He radios and says, That was just where I wanted it. Bring it in 60 yards. Otis Zachary, who he became friends with in his time in the 366, hears the message and tells his friend he is not doing it. Lieutenant Fox says to his friend, The defenses have been overrun, and the Germans are crawling around this place like ants. Something like this can't just be done So the order goes all the way up to the top, to the general's headquarters. As Lieutenant Fox waits for the answer from HQ, I'm sure he is nervous. I imagine he is thinking about all of his friends in the 366, his baby girl Sandra, and his wife Arlene. But Lieutenant Fox knows what he must do to complete the mission. In the face of racism at home, when he transferred from Ohio State to Wilberforce to racial military policy in the Italian theater with the American flag on his uniform, 
He understood completing the mission mattered above all else. As we say today in our culture, Lieutenant John Robert Fox understood the assignment. In that minute it took, which probably felt like an eternity, Lieutenant Fox hears back from HQ that they will honor his request. Lieutenant Fox is asked again if this is what he wants to do. Lieutenant Fox responds, Fire it. There's more of them than there are of us. Give them hell. And it was on this day, December 26, 1944, that Lieutenant John Fox sacrificed himself by calling an artillery strike on his position. In the aftermath of the Battle of Soma Colonia, the Germans take the village. However, not only did the 366 hold their own for as long as they could due to Lieutenant Fox's actions, approximately 100 Germans were killed from that fatal artillery strike. That's the thing I thought was interesting earlier. Think about the symmetry. The Germans fought a third of the size of their fighting force that didn't go quietly while one man from that fighting force took out a third of theirs. Lieutenant Fox's heroic sacrifice not only stopped the German advance, but it allowed the retreating soldiers to regroup, to which they were able to recapture Soma Colonia a few days later. When I initially heard the story of Lieutenant John Fox, a question I had was, what would lead a man to make that call? I'm definitely not sure if I could have. But then... When you see the full story, Lieutenant John Fox, you realize that he was groomed for this very moment from the start. I mean, think about it. He sacrificed college credits when he transferred from Ohio State to Wilberforce in order to be in the ROTC program. And then when he gets there, he learns from Captain Aaron Fisher, who took similar actions in World War I by volunteering to stay behind to complete the mission. Or even when Arlene was going into labor, and needed to get to the hospital, even though the snow was knee high, he goes and finds a tractor to pave a path to the hospital. It seems that whatever the challenge or the situation was, Lieutenant Fox was always able to meet it with conviction and understanding of what it took to accomplish the mission. And apparently, I'm not the only one who thought that. Here again is Solis Wells, researcher and author of Braided and Fire. He was a guy who embraced life so much that he knew what to do in the moment and what a difficult thing to do, but it was was the most sane thing, really, to do, to call fire onto himself, which is extraordinary. Which of us is capable of such a thing? Solis said something about Lieutenant Fox that I always think about great leaders. He loved the service. He was very proud and he worked hard at what he did. And he always said to himself that he would never ask his men to do anything he wouldn't do himself. Lieutenant Fox's body will be sent back to the Boston area where he lay rest today. And in Soma Colonia lays a marker that honors Lieutenant Fox, which is what Solis came across and started her journey, getting him his proper recognition. For decades, Lieutenant Fox's story and his sacrifice would not be acknowledged as the heroic effort that it was. But thanks to Otis Zachary, Lieutenant Fox's friend and the man who heard him give his very last artillery strike, who kept his name and his story alive, along with many others, there would finally be that recognition. And on May 15th, 1982, Lieutenant Fox would be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. And that's a great honor. But while the Distinguished Service Cross is absolutely nothing to scoff at, I mean, it is our nation's second highest military honor. However, when I think about Lieutenant Fox's actions, shouldn't it be considered for the Medal of Honor? I mean, to call a military strike on your own location has to be something that is the epitome of acts of valor and going beyond the call of duty. Well, a few years after being posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, I guess the Department of Defense thought the same thing and commissioned a study that was conducted by Shaw University. And it was determined that there were multiple African-American service members that were worthy to be recipients of the Medal of Honor. 
and Lieutenant John Fox would be one of those recipients. And on January 13, 1997, an American hero was made whole. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. When the enemy surged into a town in Italy and drove out our forces, Lieutenant John Fox volunteered to remain behind in an observation force post. He directed defensive artillery fire, and eventually he insisted that that artillery fire be be aimed at his own position. He said, there are more of them than there are of us. The barrage he so bravely ordered killed him, and when our forces recovered the position, they found his riddled body among that of 100 German soldiers. John Fox's widow, Arlene Fox, was there to accept the medal on her husband's behalf. And at Arlene's request, Solis Wells, whose research was also pivotal for this to come to pass, was in attendance. Oh, that was absolutely remarkable, the Medal of Honor ceremony. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Clinton was great in that instance. He really, it was an extraordinary moment in which there was absolute silence. The room was just, East room was just packed and just stacks of, you know, upon camera, upon camera recording this. And there was this silence in which it felt like rejoicing, you know. it it it, It really went beyond just the military which was, of course, there in full swing, you know, with Colin Powell and the whole works. Of course. But but there was a a feeling of finally, you know, the country is acknowledging its courageous members, you know, and and acknowledging the black Americans' uh, contribution in this way, that it was very powerful. It was really extraordinary. So after 50 years, Lieutenant Fox is given his proper due and awarded this nation's highest military honor, the Medal of Honor. Over the years, Lieutenant Fox would be recognized more. In 2005, Hasbro would create a Lieutenant John Fox G.I. Joe action figure. Also, in the tower where Lieutenant John Fox performed his actions as a forward observer, a museum is being created. Solis says that it would have opened this year, but COVID halted those plans. All the commemorations for this American hero Someone says that there should be another commemorative effort. Over the past two years, as systemic racism has been thrust into the American consciousness, we have been re-examining quite a bit. Statues have been removed, parks renamed, and efforts to support Black-owned businesses have expanded. Even the state of Mississippi redesigned its state flag. And there is someone who thinks that maybe, in this country, we can go a bit further in that department. And then uh, the uh, sent uh, put together the blog as a result of that and sent, sent it to Kevin Cullen and the Globe. This is Dr. Michael Krasinik, professor emeritus of political science at Bridgewater State University and host of the blog Commentary from the Commonwealth. And he is talking about his work and research with Kevin Cullen of the Boston Globe. And he has a very unique idea. And he did more research uh, on it as well from his perspective. And so, you know, the combination of uh, of that, that little video, the combination of, of my work uh, and the combination of uh, Kevin Cullen's work put together a, uh, uh, a, a an article uh, that, that did receive a good deal of attention uh, in terms of comments. And, and uh, 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 I know Kevin Cullen reasonably well, and he's he's tried to convince members of the Massachusetts congressional delegation to pay more attention to Lieutenant Fox and pay more attention to the prospect of, of perhaps, and you may have come across this, uh, changing the names of some of the uh, military establishments in our country, which are named after uh, uh, Southern generals who uh, I, I guess I have to say were, were secessionists and, and uh, uh, individuals who were against the Union of the United States. Well, that certainly is an interesting idea, isn't it? Naming a military base after an African-American soldier, maybe even Lieutenant John Fox. Fort Fox has an interesting ring to it. Here's Dr. Krasinik again. Uh, Fort Bragg, as an example, Fort Benning, uh, and, and at least pose the question of, of shouldn't uh, uh, Lieutenant Fox, shouldn't he be recognized with the naming of a military base? Uh, that, that, of course, has not happened yet. Right. Uh, 
I think the first step, which you are, I'm sure, are aware of, is that some of these statues of generals that have been taken down, which may be the first step. And and the question then is, is there another step along the way where we can recognize uh, uh, great brave men like Lieutenant Fox with the naming of a military base? I think that would be a tough call because they've been in existence since the uh, since a post-Civil War era. And it was kind of a, from what my understanding, it was a kind of uh, uh, concession to uh, southern leaders and southern politicians that even though the South lost, the North was willing to name uh, U.S. military bases after some of these uh, some of these generals who were um, shouldn't have had a, a base named after them. Not only were they against the Union, but uh, some of them were not terribly uh, good leaders. And, and from the standpoint of the Confederacy uh, and uh, from their from their lack of effective leadership during during their uh, their war of secession. So Dr. Krasinik points out that there may be another reason that naming a military installation after African-American soldier is a good idea. Uh, and, and we rely on the recruiting of African-Americans in, in the military. But more, more importantly, I, I think, uh, to my knowledge, there is not one military base or, or certainly not one major military base uh, that is named after an African-American World War II or Korean War or, or, or any, any war uh, that, that, uh, uh, that, that, should be, that should be recognized. And I think it would, it would, it would not emphasize to all Americans the role that these men played in uh, in protecting our democracy and, and helping to win the war, but at the same time recognize that uh, the, these individuals uh, should have uh, should not only be recognized for their bravery, but should be recognized uh, by our nation. That is because black America has always answered the call to defend freedom from Bunker Hill to the mountains of Afghanistan. And they come from the boroughs of New York, the streets of L.A., and just like this host, the proud neighborhood of South Memphis. Lieutenant John Fox's actions on December 26, 1944, speaks of a man that knew how to rise to the moment of the challenge that was presented. He represents the best of America in every way. No matter racial discrimination or Nazi soldiers, John Fox displayed valor, honor, and perseverance. And that is why Lieutenant John Fox is truly an all-American hero. The Black is America podcast, a presentation of Owl's Education, was created and is written, researched, and produced by me, Dominic Lawson. Executive producer, Kenda Lawson. Cover art was created by Alexandria Eddings of Art Life Connections. Special thanks to Solis Wells, author of Braided and Fire, Carl Westmoreland, senior historian at the National Underground Railroad Museum in Cincinnati, Ohio, and Dr. Michael Krasinik, professor emeritus of political science at Bridgewater State University, host of the blog Commentary from the Commonwealth. Be sure to like, review, and subscribe to the Black is America podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. For a full transcript of this episode and other resources, go to www.blackisamericapodcast.com. There, you can read our blog, leave us a review, or you can leave a voicemail message. And we may just play that message on an upcoming episode. You also can hit the donation button if you like what you heard, which helps us to create more educational content like this. Finally, thank you so much for listening to the Black is America podcast, where our history comes to life. Until next time.